Wyndham Hotels and Resorts makes travel possible for all. Whether it's the long haulers looking for a great cup of coffee, a roomier rest for the on a whim road trippers, or a place to make summer memories with the whole family. No matter who you are, where you're going, or why, with 24 trusted brands to choose from like La Quinta, Days In, and Super 8, your Wyndham is waiting. Get the lowest price at WyndhamHotels.com. Restrictions apply. Visit website for more details. Welcome to C-SPAN's Presidential Recordings on our first season, focusing on the presidency of Lyndon Johnson. Less than a week after his inauguration, now President Johnson began to talk about an investigation into the Kennedy assassination. Here's Max Holland, journalist and author of The Kennedy Assassination Tapes, on the formation of what was officially known as the President's Commission on the Assassination of President John F. Kennedy, but was more commonly known as the Warren Commission. Mr. Holland, we're going to be hearing some of President Johnson's calls from uh, November 28th and 29th, 1963. Did LBJ then encounter problems in putting together this investigation, which would come to be known as the Warren Commission? Well, the main problem he encountered was after he decided he wanted a commission, uh, getting two people to serve on it. The two people he wanted to serve on it were Chief Justice Earl Warren and Senator Richard Russell. And Warren at the time was, you know, a tremendous hero to the moderate to liberal segment of American political opinion for his Warren Court decisions. And Richard Russell was uh, a hero to conservative opinion. And Johnson's calculus, I believe, was that if he could get these two men to serve on the commission, uh, then 95 percent of respectable opinion in the united states would be mollified in other words if these two men could agree on a verdict then you know it would be accepted by a vast majority of people the problem was uh richard russell pretty much hated earl warren's guts and didn't want to serve with him so the biggest problem johnson had was and earl warren didn't want to serve on the commission because um, there had been a precedent during Pearl Harbor when a Supreme Court justice served on a presidential commission investigating the Pearl Harbor attack, and that had created a number of problems on the court because of his absences. And Earl Warren uh, knew, knew of that precedent, so he didn't want to serve at all. He had no animus particularly to Russell, and Russell didn't want to serve because he could barely stand to be in the same room with Earl Warren. So the problem of those last two days, November 28 and 29, is mostly getting Russell and Warren on the panel. And uh, a lot of the telephone calls have to do with that. And basically, Johnson uh, sort of euchred Russell into serving. He announced that he was going to serve, and Russell was just completely furious that had, that had been announced. Uh, without him giving his express approval, but he knew that uh, if he then issued a statement declining to serve, it would be a a, a big blow to uh, Johnson, and he didn't want to do that to him. Who were the other members of this commission? The other members were, well, there were two people from the Senate, one of whom was Russell, uh, a Democrat from Georgia who was highly respected, uh, one of the shrewdest men in the Senate, certainly presidential timber, but his racial views uh, sort of ruled him out for the Democratic nomination. The Republican counterpart was John Sherman Cooper from Kentucky, who had been a former judge, um, also highly respected. I mean, Johnson, of course, knew the Senate better than his own palm. And so he knew who he wanted there, and those two members probably had the uh, utmost respect of their colleagues. I I don't think you could think of two better-suited men. Uh, In the House, the two members were Hale Boggs, who was the, I believe, the majority whip at the time. Uh, He was from Louisiana, a Catholic, had been very close to John Kennedy. Uh, Then there was an up-and-coming Republican member, sort of a young Turk, named Gerald Ford, 
who was from a very conservative district in Michigan, um, and Johnson wanted to appease the you know conservative wing of the Republican Party. And then there were two private citizens who, uh, interestingly enough, were recommended by Robert Kennedy when he was asked who he wanted to have see on the commission. One was John McCloy, who was a Wall Street lawyer who had frequently served in the U.S. government, particularly during World War II as Assistant Secretary of War. And the other was Alan Dulles, who had been, among other things, director of the CIA for President Eisenhower's administration. And interestingly enough, we have Johnson's telephone calls with most of these fellows, and uh, Ford is very eager to serve because he realizes what a boost it is to his political prominence. He's kind of a backbencher in, in the House. He's not known nationally, so this is a huge boost for him. Dulles is reluctant because he feels that his involvement might uh, incite communist propaganda against the Warren Commission, uh, which is, in fact, what happened. But uh, he does agree to serve because Robert Kennedy wanted him on, and Johnson's anxious to appease Robert Kennedy. Now some of President Johnson's calls on the Warren Commission's creation. We'll start on November 28, 1963, when he called Senate Judiciary Committee Chair James Eastland. I had this feeling, I don't know, it's very confidential, I haven't proposed it to anybody, and I don't know that I would, but uh, we've got a pretty strong states' rights question here, and I have had uh, some hesitancy to uh, just start having a bunch of congressional inquiries into violation of a state statute. And it might... Well, you see, might, we've got a bill in to make it a... Bill. Yeah, I know it, but you haven't got any law, and uh, it might set a precedent that you wouldn't want to have. I talked to some of the fellows about it the day before yesterday. Russell uh, was down here for lunch. And well, we, we, one of them had already... Uh, now, my thought would be this, if we could do it. We might get uh, two members from each body... See, we're going to have three inquiries running as it is. Well, I wouldn't want that. That wouldn't do. And if we could have uh, two congressmen and two senators and maybe a justice Supreme Court take the FBI report and review it and write a report and do anything they felt like needed to be done, I think it would. Uh, this is a very explosive thing and could be a very dangerous thing to the country. Well, and a little publicity uh, could just fan the flames. President Johnson and Senate Judiciary Committee Chair James Eastland on November 28, 1963. The next day, the president called Senate Majority Leader Mike Mansfield. You'll also hear Secretary of State Dean Rusk. And it could have some uh, uh, very dangerous implications. Secretary of State's here with me now, and he's quite concerned about it. We uh, have given a good deal of thought, at least I have, on the suggestion of catching back over justice uh, to uh, having a high-level commission try to get someone from the court and maybe two or three members from each side, House and Senate, and uh, let them review uh, the investigations that been made by the Court of Inquiry and uh, the thorough one by the FBI, and let them staff it. Now, uh, uh, I have talked to McCormick, and he said that would be agreeable to him. Uh, I have talked to uh, uh, Eastland, who started the investigation, and he said that uh, that would be uh, uh, agreeable to him. I thought I'd better talk to you and anybody else you suggested, see what your reaction to it might be, and maybe I ought to talk to uh, some other people. Uh, I haven't talked to any of the justices or anything like that yet, but we think that's the best way to avoid a lot of television show, and I can, I'd like the Secretary of State to just spend a minute with you telling you some of his concerns. Well, first, Mr. President, I think it's a good idea. Yeah. Mike. Okay with me, and then you want to talk to Dixon. All right, excuse me. Hello. Yeah. Go, ahead. Go ahead, Mike. Uh, I, uh... He, here's, here's Secretary. Yeah, okay. Possible implications of this, that if they were, the rumors were to leak out as fact, and if there were anything in this that had not been fully substantiated, it could cause a tremendous storm. And it's very important that we, we work on the basis of the hardest possible information on the situation, yes, meanwhile trying to get at the absolute truth on it. Yes. So uh, I think that is very much in my mind. This has this has already been commented on, picked up right around the world, and uh, 
If we're not careful here, we could really uh, blow up quite a storm. That's right. So, uh, may I put you back to the president? Okay. All right. Yes, Mike. Uh, Mr. President, I think the idea is a solid one. I would suggest that uh, you contact Dirksen. As far as I'm concerned, you have my full support all the way, as always. Thank you. Now, Mike, we have another thing that I... Uh, just let me step to my desk and get the memo I want to ask you about. Mike, he's getting a note for me. Uh, it involves a, a special request uh, to be made very shortly. Here's the memo that came to me. Ordinarily, the widow of a president receives under the existing law, you remember we passed this last year, I believe, $10,000 a year for the purpose of answering mail. Yes. Uh, Mike Feldman calls, read, quote, the family. When I asked him to whom he talked, he said the attorney general was speaking for them. would like to have a bill introduced for Ms. Kennedy immediately to receive 50000 for the first 12 months and 10000 each year thereafter. Uh, well, that's already the law hereafter, so it's just a question of the first. The reason, according to Feldman, is that Ms. Kennedy's mail is extraordinarily heavy due to the assassination. 10,000 won't do it. Yes. Uh, Federal said the Attorney General liked to have the bill introduced today so it can be considered Monday under the suspension of the rules. I told him to hold it up until you had a chance to talk to him about it. They, the leg legislative people coming in the minute, and I rather think we ought to do it. Okay, uh, uh, we can't do it in the Senate until Tuesday, uh, Mr. Uh, President, uh, but we take it up right away and uh, get quick action, and I think Dirksen and I should co-sponsor it. Fine, okay. Okay. Uh, thank you, my friend. Fine, Mr. President. President Johnson and Senate Majority Leader Mike Mansfield on November 29th, 1963. Uh, later that day, the President gets a call from House Democratic Whip Hale Boggs, who talks about the House of Representatives' action on the Kennedy assassination. There are also mentions of New York Republican Charles Goodell, Texas Democrat George Mahan, and NAACP leader Roy Wilkins. Mr. President, yes. Bill, yeah. when the House convened today, Goodell of New York uh, took the floor and started talking about a resolution he had for an investigation and complaining about that both bodies investigating and the Senate Judiciary Committee and the House on American Activities Committee and so forth. I was in the chair at the time, so I got George Mahon to take Gavel and I got the well of the floor and said that uh, there would be an investigation, that it would not be a congressional investigation, that I thought I could say on the highest authority that there would be a higher level objective fact finding investigation. Because since that time, I've had a lot of people call me and they're talking now about. It. Well, we've got to touch these bases with everybody. Right. And we haven't got them touched with the court, of course. We haven't right. got them touched with some others. So I have said absolutely nothing about who might be on such yeah. a commission, but I've said there is going to be a commission. Yeah. Oh, well, I hope there is. I guess I've got authority to do it without their legislation. I don't I understand know. understand it under the commission executive order to do it. Uh, well, I've, I've, got, I've got my lawyers checking it now, and uh, I, I just uh, haven't... Uh, haven't got back. Uh, I've had to check it with Dirksen and Mansfield and Rayburn, I mean, and McCormick right. and you, and and then I've had Joint Chiefs of Staff, Secretary of State, Secretary of Defense all in all morning, and right. i got Roy Wilkins with me now. Right. So uh, uh, I'll get around to it and get a report as soon as I can, and I'll be back to you. Right. All I want to tell you is what happened. Mr. Okay. All right. From November 29th, 1963, President Johnson and House Democratic Whip Hale Boggs. Also that day, the president got a call from FBI Director J. Edgar Hoover, who wanted to talk about his agency's investigation. You'll also hear Mr. Hoover refer to Jacob Rubenstein, better known as Jack Ruby, the Dallas nightclub owner who allegedly killed Lee Harvey Oswald. There are also mentions of New York Senator Jacob Javits, Deke DeLoach, who would become the FBI's White House liaison, and Texas Governor John Connolly, who was riding with President Kennedy on November 22nd, and was seriously wounded. There are also references to the Texas School Book Depository, where Mr. Oswald was employed, and to Abraham Zapruder, who took the now-famous home movie of the Kennedy assassination. From November 29, 1963, President Johnson and FBI Director J. Edgar Hoover. Are you familiar with this proposed group that they try to put together on this study of your report and other things, uh, two from the House, two from the Senate, somebody in the court, uh, a couple outsiders. Well, I haven't heard of that. I, I, I've seen the uh, 
reports on this on the Senate investigating committee that they've been talking about. Yeah, well, we think if we don't have, I want to get by just to, with dear pal in your report. I think uh, it would be, be very, very bad to have a rash of investigations. Well, the only way we can stop them is probably uh, to appoint a high-level one to evaluate your report yeah. and put somebody that's uh, pretty good on it from uh, that I could select uh, uh, out of the government uh, and tell the House and Senate uh, not to go ahead with the investigation. Yeah. Because we get up there and get a bunch of television going, and I thought it'd be bad. It'd be a three-ring circus. Uh, yeah. What do you think about Alan Dulles? Uh, I think he would be a good man. What do you think about John McCloy? Uh, I'm not as enthusiastic about about McCloy. I knew him back in the Patterson, when Patterson was down here, the secretary thing. He's a good man, but uh, I'm not so certain as to the a matter of the publicity that he might seek on it. What about General Nordstrom? Uh, good man. Uh, I guess Boggs has started in the House. I thought maybe we might try to get Boggs and Jerry Ford to in the House, maybe try to get Dick Russell and uh, maybe Cooper in the Senate. Yes, I think so. I don't know. You know anything, any reason? I uh, just talked to me and you're going to talk like brothers. Yeah. You no know, other reason. Any reason, uh, uh, any there? I thought Russell could kind of look after uh, the general situation and see that uh, the states uh, and their relationship. Russell would be an excellent man. And I thought Cooper might look after the liberal group. Who's that? He's, uh, Cooper from Kentucky. Oh, yeah. Cooper. So they wouldn't think that he's a pretty judicious fellow, yeah. but he's a pretty liberal fellow. Yeah. I wouldn't want Javits or, no, no. or some of those fellows no. on it. Yeah, Javits plays the front page of Cooper, Cooper, Cooper's kind of a uh, border state. Yeah. It's not the south. It's not the north. That's right. Do you know Ford from Michigan? Uh, I know of him, but I don't know him. I saw him on TV the other night for the first time. He handled himself well on that. You know Boggs? Uh, I, oh, yes, I know Boggs. He's kind of off the resolution. Yeah, yes, know. yes, yes. I know him. Now, Walter tells me, Walter Jenkins, that, uh, that you've designated Deke to work with us like you did on the Hill. I have. Yeah, I tell you, I sure appreciate that. I didn't ask for it because I knew you knew how to run your business better than anybody else. And I just want to tell you, though, that we consider him as high class as you do, and it's a mighty gracious thing to do, and we'd be mighty happy. And well, be, we we salute you for knowing how to pick good men. Well, that's mighty nice of you, Mr. President, indeed. Oh. Uh, we're being, uh, we hope to have this thing wrapped up today, but we're being, we probably won't get it before the first of the week. This angle in Mexico is giving us a great deal of trouble mm. because uh, the stories I have this man, Oswald, getting $6,500 uh, from the Cuban embassy. Mm. Uh, and then coming back to this country with it. Uh, they, we, we're not able to prove uh, that fact. But the information was that he was there on the 18th of September in Mexico City, and we have, we are able to prove conclusively he was in New Orleans that day. Now, then they moved, they changed the date. The story came in changing the date to the 28th of, of September, and he was in Mexico City on the 28th. Mm. Now, the Mexican police have again arrested this woman, Duran, who's a member of the of the uh, Cuban embassy, and we'll hold her for two or three more days. And we've got to confront her with the original informant who saw the money pass, so he says, and we're also going to put the lie detector test on him. Meantime, of course, Castro's hollering his head off. Can you pay attention to those lie detector tests? I, I would not uh, pay 100% uh, uh, attention to them. All that they are is a psychological... Uh, asset in a in an investigation. I wouldn't want to be a part to sending a man to the chair on a lie detector. Uh, they, uh, for instance, we have found many cases where where we've used them, and in a bank where there's been embezzlement, and a person will confess before the lie detector test is finished. They're more or less fearful of the fact that the lie detector test will show them guilty. Psychologically, uh, there's that advantage because. It's a misnomer to call it a lie detector because what it really is, it's the evaluation of the chart that is made by this machine. Uh, and that evaluation is made by a human being. And any human being can uh, be apt to make a wrong interpretation. So I would not myself go on that alone if, on the other hand, in the, if this fellow Oswald had lived and had taken the, uh, the lie detector test and it had shown definitely uh, that he had done these various things together with the evidence that we very definitely have, uh, they, it would have uh, just added that, that much more strength to it. There's no question, but that he is the man. Now, the fingerprints, the things that we have. This uh, fellow uh, uh, Rubenstein down there, 
Uh, he is offered to take the lie detector test, but his lawyer has got to be caught consulted first, and I doubt whether the lawyer will allow him. He's one of these criminal lawyers from the West Coast, and somewhat like an Edward Bennett Williams type, and uh, almost as much of a shyster. FBI Director J. Edgar Hoover and President Johnson on November 29th, 1963. Have you got any... Uh, any relationship between the two here? Uh, between uh, uh, Rubenstein? Yeah. No. At the present time, we have not. There was, was he, a story down there that... Was uh, he ever in his bar and stuff like there that? There was a story that this fellow had been in this nightclub, that he had a strip tease joint that he has, but that has not been able to be confirmed. Now, uh, this fellow Rubenstein is a, is a very shady character, has a bad record, street brawler, fighter, and that sort of thing, and uh, in the place in Dallas... If a fellow came in there and couldn't pay his bill completely, Rubenstein would beat the very devil out of him and throw him out of the place. He was that kind of a fellow. He didn't drink, didn't smoke, boasted about that. He would, he, he's what I would put in the category, one of his egomaniacs. He likes to be in the limelight. He knew all the police uh, in that white light district where the joint thought in there. And he also uh, let them come in, see the show, get food and get liquor and so forth. That's how I think he got into police headquarters, uh, because uh, they accepted him as kind of a police character hanging around police headquarters, and for that reason raised no no question. Of course, they, they never made any moves as, as the pictures show, even when they saw him approaching this, uh, this fellow and got up right to him and pressed his pistol against, uh, against Oswald's stomach. Uh, uh, neither of the police officers on either side made any move to push him away or to grab him. It wasn't until after the gun was fired that they then moved. Now, of course, that, that is not the highest degree of efficiency, so I to say. Secondly, the chief of police admits that he uh, moved him in the morning uh, as a convenience and at the request of the motion picture people who wanted to have daylight. He should have moved him at night, but he didn't. And, uh, I mean, it, uh, those derelictions in that phase but so far as tying Rubenstein and Oswald together, we haven't as yet done so. There have been a number of stories come in. Uh, we've, tried, uh, we've, we've tried Oswald into the uh, Civil Liberties Union in New York, membership into that, and of course into this uh, thing, uh, this, to this Cuban Fair Play Commission, uh, Committee, which, is, which was pro-Castro and dominated by communism and financed uh, to some extent by the Castro government. How many, how many, how many shots were fired? Three. Three. Any of them fired at me? I uh, know there was another. Uh, all three at the president. All three at the president, and we have them. Uh, two of the shots fired at the president were splinted, uh, but they had characteristics on them so that our ballistic expert was able to prove that they were fired by this gun. Uh, the, the third shot, which uh, which hit the president, he was hit by the first and the third. The second shot hit the governor. The third shot is a completely is a complete bullet that wasn't shot at, and that rolled out of the president's head. I tore a large part of the president's head off, and uh, in trying to massage his heart at the on the, at the hospital on the way to the hospital, they uh, apparently uh, loosened that and it, it fell onto the the stretcher, and we recovered that, and we have that, and we have the gun here also. Were they aiming at the president? Uh, they were aiming directly at the president. So they, there's no question about that. This this telescopic lens which I've looked through, it brings a person as close to you as if they were sitting right beside you. And we also have tested the fact that you could fire those three shots that were fired uh, within three seconds. There's been some stories going around in the papers and so forth that uh, that must have been more than one man because no one man could fire those shots in the time that they were fired. We've just proved that by the actual test that we've made. How did it happen? They hit Connolly. Uh, Connolly turned. Ahead. Connolly turned to the president at the, when the first shot was fired. And I think in that, in that turning, it was where he got hit. If he hadn't a turn, he probably wouldn't have got hit. I think that's very likely. When the president got hit the second one? Uh, no, no, the president wasn't hit with the second one. At the, I see if, he, if Connolly hadn't been in his way. Oh, oh yes, yes. Uh, the president no doubt would have been hit. He'd been hit three times. He'd been hit three times. You know, on the fifth floor of that building where we found the gun and the wrapping paper in which the gun was uh, wrapped, had been wrapped, and upon which we find the full fingerprints of this man Oswald. Uh, we, uh, on that floor, we found the three empty shells that had been fired, and one shell that had not been fired. In other words, there were four, she four shells, apparently. And he had, he had fired three, but didn't fire the fourth one. He then threw the gun aside, and came down, and 
at the at the entrance of the building, he was stopped by a police officer, and some uh, worked with some manager in the building told the police officer, "Well, he's all right. He works safe. He can. Uh, you needn't hold him." So they let him go. That's how he got out. Mm. And then he got on a bus. The bus driver has identified him, and went out to his home, and uh, got hold of a jacket that he bought it for some purpose, and came back downtown, walking downtown, and. Uh, the uh, police officer who was killed stopped him, uh, not knowing who he was and not uh, knowing wh whether he was the man, but they were uh, just on suspicion, and he fired, of course, and killed the police officer. Then he walked down uh, walked you, you can prove that. Oh, yes. Oh, yes, we can prove that. Then he walked about another, uh, another two blocks and went to the theater, and the woman at the theater window selling the tickets, she was so suspicious of uh, the way he was acting and she said he was carrying a gun. He had a revolver at that time, which he had, with which he had killed the police officer. Uh, the, he went into the theater, and then she notified the police, and the police and our man down there went in there and uh, located this particular man. We had quite a struggle with him. He fought like a regular lion, and he had to be subdued, of course, and his brother was then brought out and, of course, taken to the police uh, headquarters. But uh, he, he apparently... Uh, had come down uh, the five flights of steps, uh, stairway from the fifth floor. Uh, so far as we found out, the elevator was not used, although he could have used it, but nobody remembers whether it was or whether it was. From November 29, 1963, President Johnson and FBI Director J. Edgar Hoover. Well, your conclusion is, A, he's the one that did it. B, the man he's after was the president. C, he would hit him three times except the government turned. I think that's correct. Four, that there's no connection between he and Ruby uh, that you can detect now. And five, whether he was connected with the Cuban operation uh, with money you were trying to... That's what we're trying to nail down now. Because uh, cause he, he was strongly pro-Castro. He was strongly anti-American. And uh, he had been in correspondence, which we have, with the Soviet embassy here in Washington and uh, with the, the American Civil Liberties Union and with the, the, this committee for the fair play to Cuba. We have copies of the, of the correspondence. So uh, that, uh, we've got him nailed down in, in his contact with him. None of those letters, however, dealt with any indication of violence or contemplated assassination. They were dealing with the matter of a visa for his wife to go back to Russia. Now, there's one angle of this thing that I'm hopeful to get some word on today. Uh, this woman, his wife, has been very hostile. She would not cooperate. She speaks Russian and Russian only. She did say to us yesterday down there that if we could give her assurance that she would be allowed to remain in this country, she uh, might cooperate. I told our agents down there to give her that assurance that she could stay in this country. And I sent a Russian-speaking agent into Dallas last night to interview her so that uh, we'll, we're, we've got her now. And uh, whether she knows anything or talks anything, I don't, I, I cause don't know and won't know. Where did he work in the building? On the same floor? He had access on all floors. But where was his office? Uh, well, he didn't have any particular office. Uh, he would, uh, orders came in for certain books, and some books would be on the first floor, second floor, third floor, and so forth. But he didn't, he didn't have any particular place he was stationed? No, he had no, he had no particular place that he was stationed at all. He was just a general packer of, uh, of the uh, requisition that came in for school books from the from the Dallas schools there. And uh, therefore he had access, perfectly proper access, to the fifth floor and to the sixth floor. Usually most of the employees were down on the lower floor. Did anybody hear anybody uh, see him on the fifth floor? Yeah. Uh, they, yes, he was seen on the fifth floor by one of the workmen there before the, uh, the assassination took place. He was seen there. So that, uh, that we got, got a, Did you get a picture of him? Shooting? No, oh, no. There was no picture taken of him shooting. Well, what was this picture that tell us over twenty five five dollars? That was a picture it. taken of the parade and showing Mrs. Kennedy uh, uh, climbing out of the back seat. You see, there was no Secret Service man standing on the back of the car. Mm -hmm. uh, usually, this the the presidential car in the past has had uh, steps on the back next to the bumpers, and they've usually been one on either side standing on those steps at the at the back bumper. Mm -hmm. uh, whether the president. Uh, 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 asked that that not be done, we don't know. Uh, and the bubble top was not up, but the bubble top wasn't worth a damn anyway because it made entirely a, a, a plastic. Mm -hmm. And uh, much to my surprise, the Secret Service do not have any armored cars. Do you have, do you have a, a bulletproof car? Oh, yes, I do. 
Do you think I ought to have one? I think you most certainly should have one. Most certainly should. Uh, because uh, I one here, I, we have one in New York. We use it for, for different purposes. I use it here for myself. And if we have any raids to make or have to surround a place where anybody's uh, hidden in, uh, we, we use the bulletproof car on that. Uh, because you can bulletproof the entire car, including the glass. But it, it means that the top has to remain up. You can never let the top down. It's very limiting tight. Yeah. And it looks exactly like any other car, but I do think you ought to have a bulletproof car. And uh, but, that, but I was surprised the other day when I made inquiry. All that I understand the Secret Service has had, has had it two cars with metal plates underneath the car uh, to take care of a hand grenade or a bomb that might be thrown out and roll along the street. Well, of course, we don't do those things in this country. In Europe, that's the way they, they, they assassinate the heads of state are with bombs. They've been after General de Gaulle, you know, with that sort of thing. But uh, in this country, all of our assassinations have been with guns. And uh, for that reason, uh, uh, I think uh, very definitely I was very much surprised when I learned that this bubble top thing was not uh, bulletproof in any respect and that the plastic uh, the top to it was down. Of course, the president had insisted upon that so that he could stand up and wave to the crowd. Now, you, it, uh, it seems to me that the president ought to always be in a bulletproof car. Uh, it, uh, it certainly would prevent anything like this ever happening again. Uh, it doesn't mean you could have a thousand Secret Service men on guard and still a sniper can snipe you from up in the window uh, if you are exposed, like the president was. But he, but he can't do it if you have a, have a, a solid top, a bulletproof top to it. President Johnson and FBI Director J. Edgar Hoover on November 29, 1963. Later that day, the president called Senate Armed Services Committee Chair and longtime confidant Richard Russell of Georgia and asks him to serve on the Warren Commission. You'll also hear mentions of House Majority Whip Hale Boggs, former World Bank President John McLeod, Kentucky Senator John Sherman Cooper, and Michigan Republican Congressman and future President Gerald Ford. From November 29, 1963, President Johnson and Senator Richard Russell of Georgia. We're trying to avoid having all the House Committee, Hale Boggs and a bunch, got some things started over there, and Jim Eastman and Erd Erdson and a bunch got them started in the Senate. And Bobby Kennedy's got his ideas, and Hoover's got his report, and they want to have Dewey in for a while. So uh, I've about concluded the phone that I can get people pretty well together, and I've talked to the leadership uh, on trying to have uh, the three branches have two congressmen and two senators and maybe two or three outsiders, and maybe somebody in the court or at least some person of a judicial background, that are absolutely top-flight uh, folks are uh, on about a seven-man board to evaluate Hoover's report, and it'll be largely done by staff, but they they can work on it. Bill, give me that list of the uh, uh, people, and I want to get your reaction to it. I think that'd be better than judiciary running one investigation, the House running another investigation, and uh, having four or five going in opposite directions. Because well, I agree with that, but I don't think that Hoover ought to make his report too soon. He's ready with it now, and they want to get it off just as quick as he can. Uh-oh. And he'd probably have it out today, if, if most on Monday. Well, he, he ain't going to publish the damn thing, is he? He's going to turn it over to this group. And uh, there's some things about it I can't talk about. Yeah, I understand that. But uh, I think it'd be mighty well if that thing was kept quiet another week, ten days. I, I just do. Well, I think it would be turned over as they are taking this court of inquiry in Texas. And I think the results of that court of inquiry and Hoover's report and all of them would go to this group and they would evaluate it. And uh, then maybe evaluate it for the general public. Uh -huh. Now, here's who I'm going to try to get on it. I don't know. I don't think I can get any member of the court. I'm going to try to. I'm going to try to get Alan Dulles. I'm going to try to get Senator Russell and Senator Cooper from the Senate. Oh, no, no. Get somebody else now. Uh, I know. Wait a minute now. I'm going to try to got time. get Jerry Ford. It's not going to take much time, but we got to have states' rights man or somebody that the country has confidence in. And I'm going to have Boggs' resolution over there. And I haven't talked to anybody about the membership but you. 
but uh, I would think that uh, Ford and Boggs would be pretty good. They're both pretty young men. And, both solid, sir. And I think that Cooper's a Republican, and you're a good state's rights man. I think it might get John McClaw and Alan Dulles and maybe somebody in the court. You don't get somebody in the Supreme Court. Uh, I don't know him personally, but this Judge Medina up that side, all those communists are known all over the United States. I don't know what kind of man he is. He might not do. But mm. Judge Medina, uh, mm-hmm. you know, I think you don't say it to repeals up in New York now. Who would be the best one if I didn't get the chief? I understand none of the court. No, you wouldn't want Clark, are you? I understand none of the court. No, we can't have a text. No, that's what it says. That disqualify him. Hoover tells me all three of these shots were aimed for the president. And that this telescopic sight would bring this thing up where you could uh, shoot a man as easy as you get a man sitting talking to you. I thought it was just a $7 and a half thing. Well, it was a $21 gun, but he said he looked through the telescopic sight himself and he said, Mr. President, I could uh, hit a man on that street going 20 miles an hour as easy as I could hit you sitting talking to you. That's his language. Okay, now. Well, I, I really, Mr. President, unless you, uh, well, I, I, I'm, uh, unless you really think it'd be of some yeah, damage, I know it would be. It'd save my life. I declare, I don't want to save. I anything. know you don't want to do anything, but I want you to, and I think that this is important enough, and you'll see why. From November 29, 1963, President Johnson and Senate Armed Services Committee Chair Richard Russell. That same day, the president tells Senator Cooper that he wants him to be a part of the investigation as well. The call starts with the president reading the statement that will be released about the commission's formation. The day establishing a presidential commission composed of seven distinguished Americans, headed by the Chief Justice of the Supreme Court of the United States. I've acted after full consultation with leaders of Congress and with members of my own cabinet. This commission will be established before the end of the day by executive order. Its functions will be to receive and to evaluate information obtained by all sources, the executive branch, to satisfy itself that the truth is known as far as we can know it, and report its findings and conclusions to me, to the American people, and to the world. I think that's fine. Now, I want you to go on that commission. What? Yes. Well, if you want me to go on it, I'll do it, of course. Thank you, my friend. President Johnson and Kentucky Senator John Sherman Cooper on November 29, 1963. Finally that day, the president talked to Michigan Republican Congressman and future president Gerald Ford. Chair, i got something I want you to do for me. Well, we'll do the best we can, sir. I've got to have a top blue ribbon uh, presidential commission to investigate this assassination. I'm going to ask Chief Justice to edit, and uh, then I'm going to ask uh, John McCloy and Alan Dulles. Right. And I want it nonpartisan. I'm not going to point out I've got five Republicans, two Democrats, but I'm going to do that, and I'm just... Uh, then you forget what party you belong to and just serve as an American, and I want to... Uh, Dick Russell, Sherman Cooper, uh, John Cooper, and the Senate. Dick's on armed services over there, and I want somebody on appropriation to know CIA over in your shop. Uh, uh, from appropriation angle, because I'm covering the armed services angle with Russell. I want to ask Hale Boggs and you to serve in the House. And well, and that's what it'd be McClaw and Dulles and Ford and Boggs and Cooper and Russell and Chief Justice Warren as chairman. Well, you know very well I would be honored to do it, and uh, I'll. Do the very best I can, sir. You do that and keep me keep me up to date, and I'll be seeing him. All right. Thank you very much. Thank you. I'm delighted to help out. From November 29, 1963, President Johnson and then Michigan Republican Congressman Gerald Ford. The Warren Commission presented its final report in September 1964. The 888-page document concluded that Lee Harvey Oswald acted alone when he killed President Kennedy. The report also concluded that Jack Ruby acted alone when he shot Lee Harvey Oswald in the basement of the Dallas police station when police were transferring him to the county jail. The Lyndon B. Johnson Presidential Library and Foundation, along with the University of Virginia's Miller Center, have more conversations from the Johnson presidency. You can find it at lbjtapes.org. On the next episode of C-SPAN's Presidential Recordings, President Johnson and the Civil Rights Act of 1964. Please follow this podcast so you never miss an episode.